we could spend a lot of time on each of those words. Please pray for us as we prepare with reports and petitions on our many connectional ministries in business. We'll also be considering election of candidates to the 2024 Southeastern Jurisdictional Conference. And we welcome your input. You can speak with either of us with questions, comments. There will be a special offering taken up if you'd like to participate in that. It'll be for two things. One is for new churches, for Ukrainian refugees, and also training for trauma response and faith communities. You can follow along with everything that is happening at the website wnccumc.org forward slash AC 2023. as I end, um, I wanted to mention the advantage of our connectional church as in our theme, Connect. Our founders, John and Charles Wesley, understood that the church can do and be more for the Lord together. As we move through a season of change and some disaffiliations, I want to leave you with this quote, in essentials, unity, in non-essentials, liberty, and in all things, charity. Thank you. Thank you, Pamela. Um, And then second announcement for the day, the Mitchell Scholarship is available for recent high school graduates as well as college students currently enrolled in good academic standing, the meaty part of the curve. Um, The deadline to apply is June 20th, 2023. Contact the church office with questions for more information. And check your monthly newsletter or weekly e-news for a full list of announcements. And lastly, um, I know that the most important announcement will be the pickleball scores of this past Friday between me and Pastor Eric. But I thought long and hard about this, and I don't want to, you know, burden you with trivial racquetball scores. It's two friends out there having fun, and that's really all that matters in the image of God is two people being brought together. (laughs) So... (laughs) would hate to burden you with those trivial scores. Um, <laughs> let us pray. <laughs> Dear God, thank you for this great community and all these people around us who um, not only walk the walk, but they also do talk the talk and spread the word of God in our community. Um, beautiful ministries such as Frankful Fridays and Community Meals lift up this community, and I see each and every one of you out there being a pivotal part of that. So let us be out here um, spreading not only the love of God, but also through kindness and acts of service. In his name we pray. Amen. Thank you, everybody. It's been really been great.
Did I turn it on that time? Are we good? Checking. Green light. How are y'all doing this morning? Good, good. I don't know if you caught that in Sean's announcements. I won Friday. Did you catch that? Did you, I don't know if he, he made that clear for everyone. Well, even, even with that said, I want to welcome you to back to our sermon series called Not a Fan, where what we're looking at, this is, this is based off the book, Not a Fan, the same title by the author Kyle Eidelman. I don't know if anyone's ever read that book, but it was powerful. We covered that in a life group, and it's really made me focus, kind of turn the light in on myself some, somewhat, look in the mirror and see, am I a fan or am I a follower? Do I just come here because I have to, or am I here because I'm looking for real transformation in my life? Now, I want to start out, as I do a lot of times, with, with a question, and here's the question. Have you ever been to a party where you didn't know anyone? Anyone ever been to a party where you didn't know? Just raise your hand. This is totally, yeah, there you go. All right, you're here. Thank you. Thank you. Here's the second question. Have you ever been to a party where you did not feel welcome? You ever been to that party? Really? Okay, a lot of people have been to parties where you didn't feel welcome. How about this? Have you ever been to a party where you weren't invited, but you went anyway? <laughs> right, yeah, then my wife went Whoo, like that, right, yeah. Well, it was kind of like this. When I, was in, uh, when I was in building supply sales, I had a customer. They threw a great Christmas party every year. And this, I mean, you could hear it for blocks in the subdivision where they live. And we're all there having a good time and all that. And and this guy shows up, and I'm, I'm assuming he was a veteran. He had the, the Vietnam hat on, and, and he was a double, double amputee. He was in a wheelchair, and he came in. He was like the life of the party. We all loved him. We were talking to him. He was telling jokes. He was eating the meat, eat, eating the fish, drinking the drinks, all that good stuff. And my, the contractor friend of mine was kind of helping him get around and from this station and kind of introducing him to people or whatever. And... After that, he, he, he left. He said, thank you. This was a wonderful, wonderful party. Thank you so much for all this. And he left. And Tom was like, wow, what a nice guy. And I was like, well, Tom, who, who is he? How do you know him? And he said, I don't know him. I thought you knew him. <laughs> and then we turned to other people and like, did you know him? No, no one at the party. He just showed up <laughs> at the party and ate the food. Had some beverages. Matter of fact, later, Tom, my friend, said he had given him a hundred bucks, you know, like that. And I was like, so who was this guy? And Tom just said, maybe he was God. Maybe God showed up at our party and, you know, who knows? In our scripture reading today, there's a point to all that, that that's kind of what happened to Jesus this one time when he was invited to a party and he got kind of weird and uncomfortable and then he got weirder and even more uncomfortable when an uninvited woman just shows up and kind of makes herself at home and sits at his table and so this is such a wonderful story normally I would paraphrase things like this but I just want to read all this to you this morning it's story time okay just get comfortable I want to read this is Luke chapter 7 verses 36 through 50 and it says this what a wonderful story it says one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with them and he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that Jesus was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited Jesus saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this, this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered him, say it, say it, teacher. A certain money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, the one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And Jesus said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered her, your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. 
but he who is forgiven little loves little. And Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And Jesus said to her, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. The word of God for the people of God. What a wonderful story. It's an amazing story. And here are a couple points that we need to look at a little closer. First of all, Jesus is invited to dinner at this Pharisee's house, Simon, who would have known and practiced all the customs and traditions and social protocol that any um, high-ranking Jewish person would have done who's hosting a party. Yet, when it came to this specific gathering at his house, which was probably overflowing with a plethora of Jewish mucky mucks, if you will, customs and traditions and social protocol is not exactly what Simon practiced or delivered. In fact, as it were uh, uh, Jewish custom and tradition, when Jesus arrived, Simon didn't do what? He didn't greet him with a kiss. Uh, he didn't wash his feet or at a minimum have someone else do that. He didn't anoint his head with oil, which was a sign of acceptance when you go into someone's home. Even though Simon was suspicious or knew that this guy was a rabbi, a great speaker, a prophet, quite possibly the rumors were spreading around that he might even be the Messiah. And so for whatever reason, Simon just wasn't that moved that Jesus was there. But then, boom, boom, boom. When this strange woman entered the room, that all kind of changed, didn't it? Because this woman, you know, when she saw that or heard Jesus was there and then she saw him, the record skipped, the lights blinked, and their little Hasidic curls got even curlier because it was an amazing experience for her to be in the presence of Jesus. Now, I'm curious, but why do you think that it bothered Simon that this woman was there? Does anyone know? Well, it bothered him really for a couple of reasons, and the first reason is this. In his self-righteous mind, he felt that she was what? Beneath him. She was beneath him, meaning that he was an upstanding member of the Jewish community. Well, who was she? She was a sinner, a prostitute, a woman of the night, a person who no rabbi, prophet, or would-be Messiah, even church person, would ever, ever accept. And then second, to add insult to injury, she just starts kissing Jesus' feet, where she was essentially washing them because, why, Simon didn't do it. And then she let her hair down, which no woman would have done outside of being with her husband. And then she anoints Jesus' head with oil, which was expensive, from her alabaster flask. In other words, this woman is so overjoyed, so jazzed, so bursting with fruit flavor to see Jesus that she could not contain herself. She just had to see Jesus and talk to Jesus and touch Jesus and be around Jesus. And even though she doesn't ask him for anything because she doesn't think she's worthy, Jesus just looks at her and what does he say? He says, pull up a chair, come to my table. Here you are welcome. I mean, what a beautiful moment for this woman and Jesus, right? And so in the story, here's my question. What is the difference between Simon and this woman? What is the difference? Well, the clear difference, which is quite ironic, I might add, but the clear difference is this. The Pharisee knew Jesus, yet he didn't know him. But the woman didn't know Jesus, yet she knew him. That was good preaching, wasn't it? Let me just say that one more time. I hope you, I hope you just take this away with you. The Pharisee knew Jesus, yet he didn't know him, but the woman didn't know Jesus, yet she knew him. You see, unfortunately, in so many churches today, this is the same irony and tragedy and misopportunity that so many professing members or believers of Christ, fans really, suffer from as well, meaning that they know who Jesus is intellectually, and they may even know the Apostles' Creed and, and I don't know, the Lord's Prayer and how to ring a handbell, all those things. But at, at the end of the day, they don't really know Jesus. Now, the Hebrew word used in this passage, which means to know or to be known, is going to excite all the Seinfeld fans in here today. Any Seinfeld, Seinfeld fans in the house? A few of you, a couple of you. Sean, are you a fan? Yeah, your hand went up there. Well, they use this word in Seinfeld quite often. It's yada, yada, yada. What yada actually means in the Bible 
is to know or to be known. Did you know that? To know or to be known, yada, yada, yada. In fact, to be known or for someone to see us or know our name is so important for those of us who are just trying to make a connection. Pamela just talked about that. For those of us who are just trying to make a connection in this world, for people to know us and identify with who we are. It's kind of like this. My name is not really that hard to say. I was, I mean, my name is Eric. You've, you've met other Eric's, Eric Clapton. You may not have met him, but you've heard the name. But my grandfather couldn't say my name. He called me Eric. Yeah, he did. I don't know why. I think he was just messing with me. He didn't want to say my name, Eric. But he couldn't say. So I started out with that. And then you add my last name. My last name is, for the record, Marsh Burn. Marsh Burn, right? Well, people still call me today Mash Burn, okay? And you add my wife up there. There you, there you go. You add my wife up there who has been called. Her name is Sabra. Sabra. She has been called Saber like the sword, Sarah, Sandra, Sassafras, all, all kinds of things, or Sabra, like the hummus. And if you add that to Marshburn, she's been Sabra Mashburn since she's been married to me, right? So sometimes, I don't, for whatever reason, we, we don't always make that connection with people, a name is important. It's important for people to see us. And if you've mispronounced our names, I'm not picking on you. This Maybe I'm a little bit, but not so much. You probably never do it again. But this connection we have with each other is so important because the truth is that when we have this, this intimate connection with God and with others where truth and transparency and vulnerability and individuality are the implied intangibles that more or less push the spiritual plows forward, well, then in those moments, and this is important, first we kind of get a glimpse of what heaven must look like and all that entails. And then second, the optics of the grandeur of life in the here and now are somehow made more lucid, more reachable, more inclusive, even as we are quite literally ushered into the reality of how, and this is so important, ushered into the reality of how all of God's creation is somehow connected mysteriously and poetically and stunningly, really. You see, in the Old Testament, this same word, yada, to be known, is used over 900 times to describe how God knows us, but also how God wants to be known by us, right? In fact, in my opinion, besides Seinfeld, one of the best examples of the usage of the word yada is in my favorite psalm, and you've heard me say this many times if you've heard me preach before, but Psalm 139, and it says this. This is verses 1 through 4. It says, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You see, in this passage alone, the word yada is used three times to earmark the intimacy that God wants to have in his relationship with every single one of us. Not just a group of people, you, personally, God wants to have a relationship with. And then in verse 23, and I love this, when David's writing this, if you know who David is, a man after God's own heart, David is kind of digesting how God loves him and this intimacy he wants to have. And then this is how, this is his reaction to it, a very vulnerable uh, reaction from David, I would say, as, as God is wooing him and, and offering this intimacy to him. David says this, he says, search me, O God. This is dangerous, okay? Let me say, this is dangerous. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts. How many times have you prayed that prayer? Wow, it's crazy, isn't it? That when you ask God to search your heart, it's an amazing thing. You see, when we consider this intimate connection we may have with our parents, our spouse, our children, our friends, our families, etc., well, then it's important for us to realize that's the same kind of relationship that God wants to have with us. Not just a casual, robotic, weekend visitation, kind of where we check a box, I did church today, but rather a real and profound and transformative relationship with God where we pray without ceasing and lean on God for all things and are honest and raw and vulnerable with God 
at all times. In fact, that's why John can say this in 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 and 15, uh, with a straight face, without flinching. This is what he says. He says, and this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. You see, unfortunately for so many churchgoers, the fact that they are just fans and not followers means that they are rendered, rendered relatively clueless as to what God's will is for their lives. And so suffice to say, when a person is clueless as to what God's will is for their lives, well, then that means that instead of knowing God intimately and fully, that life and faith become more like a bad cosmic version of pin the tail on the donkey, where you're blindly trying to find exactly what God's will is with, and missing it more often than finding it. You see, when we take the intentional steps to draw closer to God and really get to know him, well, then even though we won't always know what God's up to, because you won't, there's a mystery to God, too. There's an otherness of God you won't always know. Even though that's the case, we can rest assured, rest easy in the assurance of knowing that God's will is always the best. Now, just to be clear, I do understand that when it comes to our relationship with Christ, that intimacy, vulnerability, and transparency can be quite a quite terrifying thing on its own. Why? Well, because it means that we have to invite a holy and righteous and pure, sinless God into the dark, hidden, heavily guarded recesses of our weird little worlds, right? Have you ever thought about that? It's kind of like this meme. I love this. I think we have it of Jesus. That, that's what it feels like sometimes if you, just, if you just read that. When Jesus looks into our hearts, what does it say? When you invite Jesus into your heart, but then he sees what's inside there. <laughs> Woo, right? Now, that's crazy. That's crazy. You think about all the stuff you've done, all the stuff you thought about this morning, right? All those things that can kind of creep in your head or from the past, and Jesus sees that, and you're like, wow, how could God ever love me from that? You see, even though it can be a difficult first step in trusting God, for the follower, they know that God's love is what? It is a perfect love. And perfect love does what? It casts out fear. So in essence, when we make ourselves vulnerable to God, God's love and purpose for our lives will be made right as rain. We'll get it. It'll click. It won't be nearly as terrifying. God knows what we've done before we invite God into our hearts. Did you know that? I hope that's clear with everyone. God is God. God knows where you've been, okay? God, like the movie, God knows where you were last summer. He knew what you did last summer. God knows all things. And so, why is it that we get stuck in, in fan mode? Well, although there are various reasons for, for getting stuck there that include apathy and laziness and rigidness, let's call it what it is, okay? In many church circles, love, relationship, and, and yada, 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 have been replaced by theology, dogma, and club membership, right? In other words, for many churches, much like it was for Simon and the Pharisees, their default setting uh, is or has become knowledge over intimacy. Now, don't get me wrong, I've been a student most of my life, and I absolutely love to learn. In fact, studying and learning from God's Word is a necessity for the follower. You should do that, because quite often Jesus quoted Scripture, so you should read Scripture. You should join us for Bible study sometime. You're invited. If I've never done that, I invite you to Bible study right now. Come, come join us, because we have a great time going over this. So we should do that. We should study God's Word. But at the same time, as a pastor... I have to admit that I have never, ever witnessed or heard of a single case where a person fell to their knees and their hearts were strangely warmed and they shouted, I have seen the light, just because they suddenly understood the deeply profound theological premise of justification by faith. They've never done that. It's never happened that I've ever witnessed. I studied it in seminary and it didn't blow me away that much. But give me Jesus and who he is and how he loves me, that blows my skirt up every single time. And I don't even wear one. Metaphorically speaking, of course. Now, why is that true? Why is it true that the intellectual part of it will not put you in the place in the front of Jesus as much 
as having faith or having him in our life. Well, it's true because faith is caught more than it is taught. Faith is caught more than it is taught. I mean, it's kind of like this. If you don't know this about me, I know Kathy knows this about me, but if the rest of you don't know this about me, I'm competitive. Did you know that? I mean, I never let my kids win at Candyland. I was going to take them out in that magical forest. They're going down. And they never beat me. If my kids beat me at anything, they know they legitimately beat me at whatever. Um, it was, so it was true when I was a kid. I was in, in uh, vacation Bible school, as many churches are having right now, vacation Bible school. And we had this one thing where the, the first person who could name all the books in the Bible got this prize. And I did. I was like, I was studying. <laughs> Next day, had them, came back. The teacher was impressed. They're probably still talking about me right now. My picture's on the wall. It was like, this kid's amazing. And so you would think with all this knowledge I had of the Bible and holy things like that, that it would have changed my life, right? But let me tell you this. Right after I did that, we had recess, which was wonderful because you had cookies and Kool-Aid and you played games. Well, we were playing Red Rover. You know what Red Rover is? You all stand in a line, hold hands, and some kid runs across the line and you have to stop them. Well, for me, you know, you would think I would have been saved and holy and floating out to this game, but no, no, no. This young lady came across, and it was my duty to clothesline her and take her out. And she was laying on the ground, like, writhing and all that, and I was like, Mwah! and I felt good about it. So I'm not sure how much change was in my life because I knew the books of the Bible. Faith is caught more than it is taught, you see? You see, again, <laughs> you think worse of me now. And again, and to be abundantly clear, Knowing a lot about God is not a bad thing. We should know more about God because we should learn as much as we can. And plus, you're, it makes you more interesting at parties if you know stuff like that. But it's good to know about who God is. But listen to me. I'm being very serious now. But having knowledge of God or theology or dogma will never, ever in any life or galaxy near or far away replace knowing God. Knowing about, about God is not the same thing as knowing God. It just won't. Because only when we come to know God will we understand the importance of transformation. We stop clotheslining little girls, right? We understand knowing the books of the Bible doesn't make me any more holy than what I was before. It just gives me more knowledge about the books of the Bible. It's a totally different thing. And so, as we conclude this morning, and I am tired, whew, like I've been running a mile here. What is it? What is it for you? I'm being very serious. What is it for you? Are you a fan or are you a follower? In other words, is your relationship with Christ more like weekend visitations where you, like a fan, show up for games, put on the war paint occasionally, you get a comfortable seat, get the popcorn or whatever refreshments they have, and you hope that the pastor doesn't bore you to sleep. You hope that you're entertained. Or... Are you someone who is sincerely seeking the transformation that only Christ offers? Transformation that helps us, and this is so important, transformation that helps us see people the way Jesus sees people, the way Jesus sees you, the way Jesus sees me. Transformation that transcends the arrogance of church people and denominations who seem to enjoy prancing about in their self-righteousness while dooming others to an eternal fiery fate in the transformation that leads us to loving and accepting the same people who others deem as being unlovable and uninvited and undesirable and unfit and undeserving distraction to the order of life and faith altogether. Is that the transformation you want? Because if you're scared of that, you probably all just ought to go. But as soon as you invite Jesus into your heart, your eyes will get bigger. You'll see things that you didn't see before. You'll see people the way Jesus sees people. So in other words, do you really, really, ask yourself this sincerely, do you really know Jesus? Are you a fan or are you a follower? Will you pray with me? Most Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your presence, for your desire to have this intimate connection with each of us. We all have peccadillos, we all have things that we've done or thought, probably even this morning, that we, that we shouldn't have thought or may be done. But their grace is a wonderful thing. And when we have this intimate connection with you, that transformation is there. You ask us to 
you know, a ask us to, to see people, to, when we're in this world, to see people the way you do. And that only happens when we have this relationship with you, when we have your eyes. And when we stop and we slow down and we stop trying to be so holy and act like we have everything figured out and that theology is the way to happy hops to heaven, those kind of things. When we stop and put all that aside and say it really comes down to love and relationship, when we figure out that's the kind of God you are, it makes all the difference in the world. The Wesleys knew that. His heart was strangely warm when he figured out it wasn't about just building huge churches and doing this and that. It was in a moment of vulnerability as he was experiencing a defeat, going back to England. He was like, wow, my heart was strangely warmed. I get it. I get who God is. I get who Christ is. I understand why all this happened. It didn't come from memorizing the Bible. It came from having a true relationship, connection with Christ. So, Lord, thank you for asking us this question. It's an important question. Are we a fan or are we a follower? Do we enjoy just showing up and checking the box? Or are we someone who wants to step into the unknown, step into the transformation that only you can offer? I pray that we're all you know, posing that question to ourselves this morning. Lord, in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please join me in saying the prayer that our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. God bless you and have a great week.